Um, I'm, I'm pleased to introduce our speaker, Mr. Zane Scott. Zane Scott's a frequent presenter, teacher, blogger, and author, and we're very fortunate to have him as a member of our very own chapter here. So Zane has a background in law, so he brings a very unique perspective to systems engineering. He also participates in several NCOSI working groups. Zane recently finished up um, his term with the board of directors for Inter NCOSI International, and during that time he served as a chairman of their corporate advisory board. Or, uh, yeah, he served as the chairman of the corporate advisory board. Um, Currently, Zane's a member of NCOSI International Technical Leadership Institute, and he's also the Vice President for Professional Services at Viatech. Um, so now I want to turn this over to Zane. I want to let everybody know that hold your questions to the end. We'll have a, you know, hopefully a 15-minute uh, uh, end of session question uh, session. Um, if you want, you can maybe type them into the chat for all ahead of time. And then, you know, at the end, we'll select folks to, uh, to ask questions. So, um, Zane? Also, one last thing oh, before he yeah. starts is if you guys hang on till the end of the meeting, Clinton's oh. going to have, uh, introduce, um, raffle off our uh, prize tonight. Yes. And we're going to do that randomly. So stay on. We'll announce the winner and then we'll just work with you. We have your email address from uh, when you signed up. So we'll get in Correct. touch with you. Correct. All right, guys. All right. And please put your uh, questions in the uh, chat. We'll, we'll discuss them after um, uh, Zane is done. All right, Zane, take it. Thanks, Paul and, and Clinton, um, and thanks everyone for the invitation to be here tonight. Um, I say be here uh, with a sense of, of being a little bit deprived. When I first uh, started to arrange this, we were going to do it in person, and I was really looking forward to a chance to come back and be with my chapter for a chapter meeting. I get to watch the uh, videos online which is, is nice, but there's nothing like being there with you. I hope everybody had a good dinner tonight, uh, as we usually do at, at Chesapeake. Uh, you, you know, they say we're either going to emerge from this virus thing with uh, tremendous culinary skills or a, or a huge drinking problem. So I hope that everybody was exercising their culinary skills tonight to get dinner prior to the meeting. Um, and I really do appreciate the opportunity to talk to you about this and to uh, share with you for the next 45 minutes or so. I want to begin with a, a story that I heard recently about four brothers who had left home, gone to college, gotten into business, and become very successful and prosperous. Several years after they were, were established in their businesses, they were chatting together after having dinner one night, and they got around to discussing the gifts that they were going to give to their elderly mother who lived way away from them in another city. The first brother said, I'm having a big house built for mom. The second one said, well, I'm, I'm having a $100,000 theater built in that house. The third one said, I had my Mercedes dealer deliver a $130,000 S-Class coupe to her. And the fourth one said, you know, you know how mom loves reading the Bible. And you know she can't read anymore because she can't see very well. Well, I met this preacher who told me about a parrot that can recite the entire Bible. It took 20 preachers 12 years to teach him to do that. And I had to pledge to contribute $100,000 a year for 20 years to his church, but it was worth it. Mama just has to name the chapter and verse that she wants to hear, and the parrot will recite it for her. Well, the other brothers were duly impressed. After the holidays and the gift giving had taken place, Mom sent out her thank you notes. To the first son, she wrote, Milton, the house you built is so huge. I only live in one room, but I have to clean the whole house. Thanks anyway. 
to the second she wrote, Marvin, I'm too old to travel. I stay home. I have my groceries delivered, so I never get to use the Mercedes. But it was a good thought. Thanks. To the third, she wrote, Michael, you gave me an expensive theater with Dolby Sound. It holds nearly 50 people, but all my friends are dead. I've lost my hearing, and I'm nearly blind, and I never get to use it. But thank you for the gesture, just the same. And to the fourth, she wrote, Dearest Melvin, you were the only son to have the good sense to give a little thought to your gift, something I could really use. The chicken was delicious. Thank you. Now, that actually is, uh, is a joke to start with, as, t as speakers are encouraged to do, but it, it's an illustration of what we're going to talk about. Because we deal with the world using models. Humor works because it violates our model of how the world works. The punchline becomes a surprise. And the surprise violates the way that we think the world is set up to operate. And the more shockingly it violates it, the, the bigger the surprise and the funnier it seems. Of course, telling a joke to an audience that you can't hear respond is, a, is an interesting experience. So if you want to know how that feels, I invite you after the meeting is over to and you're closing down your computer to just tell a joke in an empty room. Uh, it's an entertaining experience in and of itself. But tonight we're going to talk about models and we're going to talk about how models are used in the natural world, how we, how we as humans are hardwired to use models for various purposes. And then we're going to talk about how we use models as systems engineering and why there's no such thing as non-model based systems engineering. So we'll begin with how we use models. The first way we use models is in our thinking. Charlie Munger is Warren Buffett's investment partner and guru and foil and discussion partner. And uh, Charlie says, well, the first rule is you can't really know anything if you just remember isolated facts and try to bang them back. You have to have a, hang them together on a lattice work of theory or you don't have them in any usable form. You've got to have the models in your head and you've got to array your experience, both vicarious and direct, on this latticework of models. You've got to hang your experience on a latticework of models in your head. And that's so true because the only way that we can take in the blizzard of facts that come our way at, at an ever increasing uh, rate is to have internal models, mental models, that we use to hang the facts together. These models operate like a card catalog and the Dewey Decimal System and the shelves in the library arranged according to them operate with the books. Just as, as the library organization keeps the library from just being a big stack of books, that we would have to paw through in order, to find, in order to find something, our mental models and the lattice work that they hang in act as a way of organizing our thought and our learning and our ability to deal with knowledge in the world. So the first way we use models is to think with. The second way we use them is in communication. Whatever the mode of communication, its purpose is always to transfer information from the sender to the receiver. And so we are not able to <clears throat> talk about anything or to transfer any information except through the use of a model. <clears throat> Excuse me. The object of communication is for the sender to get the model in the sender's head to match the model <clears throat> in the receiver's head and for the receiver to facilitate that process by communicating back and forth. So as, as one person talks to another, <coughs> excuse me, or communicates really in any way, what they're doing is they're attempting to match those models, those mental models in their head that Charlie Munger talked about. 
So the models in our heads not only facilitate our communication, but they can become impediments to it as well. How does that happen? That happens when I have one model in my head and you have a different model in your head and we think we're talking about the same model, but we're not. We're each working out of our own heads in an attempt to communicate with each other. I do an exercise and I would have done it in this meeting had we been face to face. But what I do is I have everybody close your eyes, which is kind of unnecessary in this setting, and think of a horse. Just picture in your mind a horse. And after I've given people a few seconds, then I ask them, Everybody who pictured a white horse, raise your hand. <clears throat> and everybody who pictured a brown horse, raise your hand. Everybody who pictured a black horse, raise your hand. And everybody who pictured another kind of horse, a, a, a dappled or gray or a pinto, raise your hand. And a segment of the audience every time raises their hand for each one of those. We have the fundamental model of a horse in our minds, four legs, a mane, and a tail. Um, although if you're a junior high school boy, you might envision uh, shooting basketball when I say horse. But most of us have this four-legged model in our minds. How can that become an impediment? Well, it becomes an impediment as I said, if we're dealing with different models in our minds. But what if this model's pretty much fundamentally the same, four legs, mane, and a tail? What if the only differences are color and appearance? How could that possibly be become something that matters? Well, let's say we're trying to put a get together a team of matched Clydesdales to tow a wagon we're not gonna be able to cope very well with skinny horses, small horses, large horses, black horses, brown horses. They're gonna to need to match. So at some point, matching the model becomes very important to our thought and to our communication. Now, the way that we get the model to match and the way that we begin to deal with it in model-based systems engineering is we surface the model. We surface it in a way that everybody who is concerned, everybody who's designing the model that's designing a system solution to a problem, or everybody who's modeling the problem, everybody who's involved in this, all the stakeholders and everybody, can get a vision of the model and everybody can be on the same page. So a surfaced model can align our communication and become useful. Well, as you can see, it's not really possible for us to think about anything or to communicate about anything except through a model. And the issue becomes, where is that model? Do those models reside only in our heads, mainly in our heads, or are we gonna surface the model and put it out where we can get at it? So let's think about the essence of what's a model for a minute. Fundamentally, a model is a limited representation of a particular reality. And the key word there, of course, is limited. The model is limited in some way. The model is not the reality. As the saying goes, a map is not the actual territory. Here we have two maps of the Washington metro area. One is a satellite picture with the roads highlighted, a network of roads are highlighted on this map. Uh, and that's, that's a kind of a model, a kind of a representation of a model of the Washington metro area, but it's not the Washington metro area. There are lots of things you can't tell from that that you could tell if you were on the, there on the ground. The direction and speed of the wind, for instance, or the ambient temperature, uh, numbers of things, uh, information that are not included in there because that's limited to a picture with the roads highlighted on it and the, the uh, boundaries drawn. 
The map on the right, of course, is recognizable to all of you guys uh, and to me as a map of the metro system in DC. That's also a limited representation. In many ways, it's more limited than the picture on the left because it's simply a picture of the subway and the subway stops. It's limited, it has issues in terms of how closely it approximates the ground, the, the metro area that it's modeling. So if we were to measure actually on the ground, the difference between those metro stops, I'm gonna bet, and I, in fact, I know for a fact, that they're not as equally spaced and regularly spaced as the metro stops that are depicted on this particular model. Um, they're not aligned, so things that appear to be directly east and west of each other may not be east and west of each other actually on the ground because this is a different kind of a representation. We sometimes get confused about this concept and we begin to talk and act as if the model is reality. How many times have you heard someone steeped in Myers-Briggs say something like, I am an INFJ um, or so I'm an ESPN. Well, of course ESPN is not one of the uh, personality models in Myers-Briggs, but neither of these persons is either one of those things. The Myers-Briggs four-letter categories are simply models of a category of personality types that form some approximation. How good an approximation depends on what you think about Myers-Briggs, but they are not reality. So when this guy says, I am an INFJ, well, no, not so much. Um, you're not. You are you and your personality is your personality. George E.P. Box said something that gets quoted a lot. Um, and one of the problems is that this is the only portion of it that gets quoted. All models are wrong, but some, is, some are useful. This is the cute part of what he said, and the truth expressed here is that, as we said, models and representations are not reality. So hence, by definition, all models are wrong, just like E.P. George Box says that they are. But George Box went on to say something else as well, and this is where the really smart thing that he, he has to say comes out. He said, all models are wrong, but some are useful. The practical question is, how wrong do they have to be not to be useful? And that's the question that bears on us as, as systems engineers. So we've seen that there's no way that we can do non-model-based systems engineering because we're gonna work with models. And the serious question is, how wrong do models have to be to not be useful? And the question that goes along with it is, how can we tell whether they are or are not actually useful? Well, let's consider our friend, the farmer. This particular farmer is a dairy farmer, like my grandfather was, and he's got a herd of cows and he has a problem. His milk production is down and he can't figure out why. He's tried everything, changing their feed, moving their pasture, rotating them around in the milking order. He's done all sorts of things in an attempt to shake up the milk production, no pun intended. And he's kind of stymied, so he thinks, you know, the smartest person I know is my friend, the engineer who lives down the road. So he calls the engineer and says, hey, could you come up and let me tell you about this problem I've got, see if you can help? So she comes. And she says, yeah, I think I can help you, but I need to think about it a little bit in order to come up with a solution. So she goes away and two weeks later, she comes back up the road, letting him know that she thinks she has an answer for him. So the farmer's anxious to hear the answer. So he, he wants to know 
what it is that she's come up with. Well, when he asks her, she begins. First, we have to assume a perfectly spherical cow with milk homogeneously distributed throughout. Well, here she's using a model. And the question for the model is going to become, are the assumptions she's making, taking the model so far away from reality that she's not going to be able to meet her purpose in using the model? And the purpose is to try to figure out what the problem with milk production is and how to change the production in the direction that the farmer wants. That's because when we deal with models, what we find is that as the more, the more limitations we apply to a given model, the, the further down it goes on this uselessness scale, usefulness scale rather. So usefulness declines in direct proportion to the limitations that are applied to our models. But remember, Box's question is, not will they, will they become wrong or not useful, so wrong that they're not useful at some point, but where is that point? And that was because he recognized that you could tolerate a decline in usefulness up to the point where they were just so wrong that they were no longer useful. So this, this curve actually looks like this. It, it, it comes down, it reaches a point, and it becomes a step function that steps down to zero. Well, where is this line? That's the $64 million question. This line is at the purpose for the model. That's what determines the point at which the model becomes useful or not useful when it crosses the line of fulfilling the purpose of having the model in one direction or the other. So let's go back to our map of the metro. It's wrong, but is it useful? Well, we know it's not to scale. Those stops, as we pointed out, are not equally spaced. The points don't align in relationship to each other. So as a geographical map of the area, it's probably not useful. But when we look at it, the metro stops are in order and they're characterized either as transfer stations or stations along the line. So if what we intend to use this model for is what it's actually used for when it's posted everywhere in the metro, this is the model that you look at when you're, when you're looking at the uh, the wall of the train and you, you see this, if it's intended to use to tell where we are in relation to where we want to be, this is a great model. So if we want to know how to get from Union Station to Metro Center, we know we get on to the train on the red line and we head in the Shady Grove direction and we go three stops and then we're at Metro Center and we can change to the, to the orange or the gray line at, at Metro Center. So we know what we need to know. The model is successful because it fulfills its purpose. It is useful. So it's, it's very, very wrong in some senses, but it's useful in that it fulfills its purpose. That's what is true of system models. So when we're begin, beginning to model systems, when we model a, pro, a problem, when we model a solution, what we want to know is how are we going, where, at what point does that model become useful? What does it have to have to be useful? Well, let's inquire for a minute as to what a model is. And NCOSI has a new definition, thanks to an effort by the NCOSI fellows. The new definition of system is a system is an arrangement of parts or elements that together exhibit behavior or meaning that the individual constituents do not. It used to be that this just simply said that it, they together exhibit behavior. But in an effort to make, um, 
make this useful in empirical models that we use in the knowledge area or even design models that we use in the knowledge area. They added the word meaning to the definition and broadened it out for a, for a wider use. But it still contains the three basic elements of a model. There has to be an arrangement. In other words, you can't just have a collection of parts or elements. And you have to have the parts and the elements that are arranged together in relationship to each other. And then they exhibit behavior or meaning that the individual parts or elements do not. So those are, the, those are the three parts of the definition of a model. If you get a definition of a model from, from almost anywhere else, you're almost always going to get this as a definition of a, of a system. So when you're looking at what's a system, you're, you're going to see these three aspects. Now, in order to see the system, we have to take what's known as a system view. Robert Edson, who now works for MITRE, wrote a book a number of years ago called Systems Thinking Applied, which is a great primer about systems thinking. I use it quite often to get myself realigned, to go back and check concepts, um, to, to think about ways of expressing those concepts in my teaching. So that, that book has been very useful to me. And he says in the book that systems thinking is the view that system and problem situations cannot be addressed through reducing the systems to their component parts. Well, if you look at the illustration here, one, the, on the left is a, a cloth spread out on a table full of all the parts of a, of a digital camera. And on the right is an assembled digital camera. Now, somebody in a room full of engineers is going to catch the fact that that this is not the uh, digital camera that's seen there assembled it's a it's the constituent parts of a different camera be that as it may if we want to think about the camera as a system we can't do it by thinking about the individual parts we have to think about it as a camera as a functioning system and then Robert goes on to remind us that systems thinking is a process. It's an ordered, methodical approach to understanding problem situations and identifying solutions to those problems. So our process needs to be systematic and our thinking needs to be systemic. Now, Fritjof Capra goes even a step further in giving us a warning. He tells us that we need to remember that the, the properties of a system are properties of the whole. And they depend on and arise from the interactions and relationships among the constituent parts. These properties are destroyed when the system is dissected, either physically or theoretically, into isolated elements. That's a critical sentence. This is from his book, The System's View of Life, and that's probably the most important sentence in the whole book. For those of you who think this name might ring a bell, um, if you're of a certain age, uh, of which I am of that age, you'll remember that Capra was the, the particle physicist who wrote a book in the early 70s called The Tao of physics. Now, he was at that point in his life attempting to correlate the principles of particle physics with the principles of Eastern religions. Um, he and a number of other people were investigating that area, probably most of them with the help of uh, several different varieties of mushrooms. But that investigation has led Capra into an ongoing investigation of the nature of systems that has spanned his career. And uh, he is today an ecobiologist. Um, and what led him from physics to biology was the study of systems. 
So what makes a system model useful? Well, the first thing is that we need to keep in mind the purpose of a, of a system model. The purpose is to help us as systems engineers to make a prediction as to whether a specific design, the design that's being modeled, will satisfy the stakeholder needs. That's the sine qua non of successful systems engineering, is being able to make that prediction. So in order to be useful, the system model has to help make that prediction. How, and in order to do that, it needs to answer two questions. How will the design behave? And will that behavior meet those stakeholder needs? So there are some characteristics that we need. The system model needs to offer us a system view. Remember the, the characteristics, the, the behavior, the uh, aspects of the system that we're interested in can only be seen at a system level because the properties of a system are the properties of the whole, not the parts. So if we're looking at the parts or a portion of the whole, then we're not able to get the system view that we need from our system model. It has to be complete and consistent. How can it, how do we know, how are we assured that it's complete? We're assured that it's complete if it's built on a structure that's tried and true. Um, and we'll talk a little bit more about system meta models in a minute. And it needs to be consistent. And in order to be sure it's consistent, we have to have that system view to make sure that it's internally consistent with itself and that it's consistent with its purpose. And again, remember, we're trying to make that prediction by asking those two questions about how the design behaves and whether that behavior meets the stakeholders' needs. So how do we go about making our system models useful? Well, the system behavior emerges from the interaction of the system elements. So we've got to be able to see the system elements and we have to be able to see the relationships and interactions among them. So to predict that behavior, we've got to be able to show that in our, in our models. In order to show it in the models, we need to build the models on a coherent, consistent framework preferably one that's tried and true. The one you're looking at is the one that, that we at, at Vitek have used for several decades now and refined over time. And it's proven reliable in constructing models of everything from the property casualty payment systems of large insurance companies to submarines, to airplanes, to healthcare systems. Uh, but this is a this is a system, it's not a domain specific kind of a, of a schema. It's a schema that's useful in any system model construction. In order to make it useful, we have to have a clear view of the system. If our view is blurred, if we fail to provide that clear system view, then that's gonna lead to an inability to make the prediction that we have to make. There are some issues with getting a clear view. One that's fairly commonly encountered is the idea that we can have many models or at least have many tools. So I don't know how many times I've been told by someone, well, I have a component model, I've got a requirements model, I have a behavior model, and uh, I put all that kind of stuff together and we look at that and, and that's our system model. Well, to be perfectly honest, no, it's not. Why? Because these are not tied together. Remember Capper's warning, when it's dissected either physically or theoretically into isolated elements, the properties of the system are destroyed. And in looking at a model, they're destroyed in the sense that we can no longer accurately see them or make predictions about the properties. Another fallacy is that we could take a bunch of views, aggregate them, um, aggravate must have been a Freudian slip there. We can aggregate a number of views and then we'll have a model. Well, once again, no, we don't. Why? Because models are simply, or views rather, are simply slices of the model 
subsets of the information that go into making a true robust systems model presented according to the rules for making the diagram. So you can argue all day that you have good rules for making the diagrams, but you're always dealing with a stack of subsets. When you deal with a stack of views, you've always got a stack of subsets of the model information. And once again, we're violating what CAPRA is warning us about and losing our ability to make the prediction by fragmenting the model. Another issue that we run into is that we want to have standards and the idea of having standards is good, except if we adopt some kind of an arcane standard. So if we standardize on our communication on Egyptian hieroglyphics, we're golden as long as we're dealing with ancient Egyptians. Um, but not many other people can read hieroglyphics. Now, of course, nobody's proposing that we standardize on Egyptian hieroglyphics, but we do have proposals that we standardize, for instance, on the, the notation from the world of software, that that could become our standard. Well, what happens when I'm doing a model of the throughput from an ER system to an operating system in a hospital? Can I take uh, UML and SysML based diagrams and show it to the hospital administrator and say to her with a, with a straight face, you know, here's a depiction of the throughput of your healthcare delivery systems in your hospital. She's going to immediately not resonate with the, with the symbology with the standard. And when we standardize, when we, when we set a standard, we start to limit. And when we limit, if we do it, we are, we're drawing borders around not only the expression of what's in our model, but we're drawing fences amongst our audience and we're excluding people who don't resonate with that explanation. The views are our vocabulary and we should never forget that the broader the group of people that we need and want to communicate with, the broader our vocabulary needs to be. While we're on the subject of language, let's talk about another issue that comes up. That's the issue of oversimplification. Very often this is done in the name of accessibility. We need to make our system language accessible. Um, it needs to be simplified. Most often this is done by by reducing the vocabulary again into categorical vocabulary and we make one word do service for several different concepts. The most accessible English that most of us ever encountered was in our opening readers when we began school. For those of us again of a certain age, those were the Dick and Jane readers. So Dick and Jane had a dog named Spot and we would read things like see Spot run. That was accessible English, accessible language, no question about it. As long as you had one dog, his name was Spot, and all he ever did was run, you were good to go. But if Spot developed hip dysplasia and had to go to the vet for an operation, you were hurting if you were gonna try to, to explain that to anyone using your accessible English that had become the framework for, for learning to read. So you, complex subjects, Complex problems, complex solutions need a language with sufficient nuance and complexity to express the concepts that are contained in, in the models and in the solutions and problems that we're dealing with. What happens with all of these issues is that they take us to that point where our models will lose their usefulness. Usefulness will decline to zero because we can no longer fulfill the purpose. If we, if we can't see the system, then we can't think about the system, we can't communicate about the system, and most importantly of all, we can't make the predictions that we need to make. Now, what are the takeaways from what we've been talking about? Well, models help us think and communicate. In order to think about systems, we need to be able to see them in whole and not in parts. 
And we need to make those predictions about our possible solutions. Will they, will they meet the stakeholder needs? And we need to communicate our ideas and findings and conclusions to a variety of other people. So we need a language that makes us possible for, to do that. We need a model that makes, us, makes it possible for us to make the predictions and a language that makes it possible for us to think and communicate about them. This, the lessons in, inherent in this are that when we deal with a wide audience, we need a wide vocabulary. So we shouldn't constrict it. We shouldn't limit it. We should, should make available all of the vocabulary that we need. The wide audience needs clarity. We shouldn't obf obfuscate it with arcane expressions, but we should be able to be clear as we communicate. Complex systems and subjects need a rich vocabulary, so we don't need to oversimplify our vocabulary and cost ourselves the ability to communicate. The system needs to be seen in whole, so we don't need to be fragmenting it. We don't need to be carrying it in multiple, multiple tools per model. We don't need to fragment it in that view. We don't need to think that views without a database model underpinning them can in any way construct a model. What that does is that it makes the model invisible again, because the real model resides in the designer's heads and the views are expressions of what are in their heads. And as good as those expressions may be, they're never gonna give us a system view of the whole model, the whole solution, or the, give us the ability to make predictions about it. I appreciate your time and attention, and uh, I'm ready to take questions if somebody's ready to read them to me. Yep, I'm here, uh, Paul Good. Martin here. Hey, um, looks like you did so well, nobody's asked any questions. <laughs> they did like your joke, though. They really <laughs> loved your joke. Oh, well, that's gratifying. <laughs> <laughs> so I want you to know people did uh, get to uh, laugh, even though you didn't hear it. Good, so good. I, I know how you feel. I'm teaching a class online, 20 students, and I show them a Dilbert cartoon, and there's nothing. And I'm like, not even a chitter. Oh, that's right. They're all on silence. So I can't <laughs> hear them. So anyway. A college professor friend of mine said that what this is like is it's like playing tennis by yourself. Oh, yeah. You serve the ball and it just doesn't come back. Yeah, it's just like what? Yeah. Hey, but Mark, I know you, do you guys have are a out question. There. It looks like I Mark. Have a question, yeah. If, uh, yeah, for Zane, I, I really enjoyed that. I, I thought it was really good. I had I actually had two questions. When you just talked about the usefulness declines to zero if it's uh, oversimplified, is that decline pretty much an avalanche, like you uh, suggested by the graph, or can it degrade gracefully? Well, it theoretically it could degrade gracefully, but the there is a point where you can't make a prediction anymore. And when you reach that point, it goes like an avalanche. Okay. And thank you. And and my other question was back when you were talking about the uh, definition that Nkosi had refined for the system definition. Mm-hmm. What happened to the notion of an emergent behavior? Because that was rather prevalent in system definitions of our definitions of systems for a while, and then it just seemed to kind of fade away. Well, emergent behavior, of course, is still there, um, still there in reality. I'm I'm not sure about its status in the in the definition. I don't think the fellows address that concept specifically um, Maybe, in explaining their definitions. Yeah, I, I can talk a little to that because I was um, in their uh, meetings for that thing. And, and it, normally the, the emergence is still there uh, within a, a further explanation. Even the handbook makes a big deal about emergence. Right. Um, and so I don't think it's gone away. I, they may... In a simple definition like that, maybe they didn't put it, 
actually, I think they have something that's like a paragraph or two when you really talk to it. So you would have to pull that up to look at it. Oh, okay. Thank you. Yeah, no problem. It, one of my favorite examples of emergent behavior is a, is a big, long, big, long board and a rock. And a board is just a board and a rock is just a rock until you, you put the two together. Yeah. You get your, your um, seesaws. Yeah. It's true. yeah. Or, well, yeah, it's a lever. I and like, I, I like, like the, the uh, model. <laughs> I like the uh, illustration of uh, uh, water. You know, water is wet. A hydrogen atom is not wet. Yeah. Good An oxygen point. atom is not wet. And actually, an H2O molecule is not wet. Mm -hmm. But wetness emerges from the combination of the, of the water molecules into water itself. Yeah. And it emerges. Yeah. That's, that's very interesting. I, I hadn't heard that before. But yeah, there's, a little, heard. there's a little poem, and I, I'll email it back to Paul and let him distribute it. But there's a a German uh, engineer who wrote a little poem about water, a water molecule is not wet. And he has several others that, that go with it, but it coolly illustrates emergent behavior. Yeah, and, and actually, uh, it's Paul again, I, I've been doing a lot of research into emergence. It's not a, a very good scientific thing. I mean, we understand it, but science is all about tearing things down and understanding them and emergence is putting things together and looking at it and science doesn't quite do that. We as system engineers do that quite a bit, but um, it's really a mystery to science how emergence happens. There is no explanation. So it's, it's a great thing to look into. Yeah. Yep. Uh, so we'll find somebody to talk about that in the future. So with that in um, mind, if nobody else has any questions, I think we just want um, Clinton to come back on board and talk about what's happening next month. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and I'm going to go ahead and share the screen of our website. Okay. Actually, um, so I'm going to I'm going to give a preview for next month. We're going to be doing another virtual presentation by another member of our. Um, Chesapeake chapter, Mike Pafford. Mike Pafford's going to do um, a presentation um, that I think may be very relevant and pertinent to our current uh, times here with the, um, the um, COVID and such. Basically, he's going to uh, talk on a topic on some recent work that he's done with the NCOSI Requirements Working Group. Uh, that's on the Resilient Hospital Reference Model. And this is an MBSC-based project focused towards developing a framework hospitals uh, may use to enhance their catastrophic event preparedness. So that's why I was saying it sort of looks like maybe this talk may lead to some stimulating discussion on its applicability to our current situation. Um, so that's next month. So I hope to I hope we get just as good uh, participation from our memberships on, on that. And I hope by then we iron out some things too. So Paul, can you know I'm going to raffle off the uh, door prize right now. Oh, perfect. That's Is that okay? okay? Well, yes. Are there a and let questions? me let me show. Um, so if yeah, yeah, you can show the book or the. Show let's the, see. We have it down here. There uh, it is. System thing. thing. Yeah. Yeah, by uh, Albert Rutherford. I, I didn't read it, but I've, I've, I bre bre um, previewed it, and it is a pretty interesting book. Uh, Zane, I believe, recommended this book. So, um, Paul, can you allow me to share my screen? Yes, absolutely. Let me, uh, okay. like you said, we're trying to learn how to work yeah, this yeah, thing. Yeah. I see, pause, share. I, how do I stop my sharing? Does anybody know? Nope. That, oh, there it is. Stop share. Okay, good. Okay. Up to you now. Yeah, let me share my, here it is. This is what I want to share. I'm telling you guys, we're going to be right. so good at this in about this. two wheel months. Of, um, there we go. Wheel That's of your uh, wheel of names. Encoded. Oh, wow. Nice. So I'm going to spin the wheel. I put all the uh, registered members in and uh, 
Uh, uh, this is impressive, I must say. Yeah. So it looks like our winner tonight is... Colin Crafts. Colin Crafts. Yay. <laughs> All right, Colin. Colin, I'm sorry. Colin, I'm, I'm going to use the email that you registered with to... Um, to uh, email you and, and get your mailing address. And that, that sounds great. Thank you. You'll be receiving the book in the mail. Yay, Colin. Good job, guys. Good job. Um, just, okay, now I'm going to go ahead. How, now, how do I yeah, stop you from control. sharing? Let's see. Do I just, I think I hit share screen and just turn you off. And then I go back here. All right. Um, Oh, and hit share. And everybody can see. There you go. So just as everybody leaves, I want to encourage you, when you get on the website, uh, just remember it, it does get a little tricky, and we, we apologize for that. But if you go to resources library, uh, you'll see all our previous newsletters and archived newsletters. But one nice thing is this whole after action reports. If you ever want to read on previous ones you can actually click one for the monthly meetings our sep galas holiday parties and things like that so all those are available to you and when you click on the actual um uh, uh chapter sense there you can actually see where everything is and in every one of them you should be able to go in and download their slides or watch the ver the video on YouTube as well. So I wanted to encourage people to do that uh, and look for that as well. Now we do have um, our musings, which I believe is in our library down below, system engineering and ruminations. These are some classic blog posts uh, that you may find enjoyable. So that's about it. We can't thank you enough um, for everybody being here. Um, uh, again, uh, just put in the comments if you have any uh, uh, lasting thoughts. I'll let this uh, stay on for a while uh, until most people hang up. But I'm going to be uh, ending the meeting uh, fairly uh, shortly here. All right. Uh, uh, Paul, I have another one more question for Zane. Oh, I hope he's still there. Zane, you still so, there? Or did you go? I to am here in spirit and truth. There you go. Yeah, Zane, I, I love the title of your talk, and I just wanted to ask you, uh, if you run that to its uh, conclusion, you're, you're saying that everything in system engineering is model-based, correct? Yes. I yeah, love it. Including a, a big Word document that describes your system. That's a model. Well, actually, yeah. so actually I, I would argue that that's a view. That's a view. Oh, there you go. That's but, a good and the model is in the is is in my head. So if <laughs> when I when I write a novel, ah. I create a world. The model's in my head, oh. and I can I can express that. But but the model always is is in my head, and there may always be confusion. Ah, yeah. Carl, okay. I Carl stop Sandberg that to my students. <laughs> Carl, Carl Sandberg, the poet. Uh, was on Johnny Carson one night, and uh, Johnny Carson asked him, he said, you know, I've always been dying to ask you, um, what, is it, what did you mean when you said uh, the fog comes on little cat's feet? And Sandberg was quiet for a second, and then he said, you know, when I wrote that, only God and I knew. He said, now only God knows. <laughs> and that's the problem with the models in our heads is that until we get them out and surface them and put them out where we can work with them, where we can talk intelligently about them and all be on the same page, then we're really not taking advantage of model-based systems engineering. Excellent. Good, good way to end it. We really appreciate everybody being here. Yeah, outstanding uh, answer. Thank you. Yeah. And it's, it's 8 o'clock, so we're going to go ahead and uh, shut this down. We hope you do um, come uh, next month. We have another one of these. We might be a little more polished. You never know. Um, we're going to try. We, yeah, <laughs> and we really appreciate And go on time. And we'll really appreciate everyone coming out that they did.
And again, congratulations to our um, Colin for winning the book. So we'll catch you all next month.